Lumber Camp Life in Michigan, an autobiographical account by Jacob Dye, 1880-1893, and his son Rex J. Dye, 1904-1909. I have a personal interest, this is separate and aside from the book, my comment, um, I have a personal interest in um, the lumbering camps of Northeast Michigan. Um, were it not for them, I probably wouldn't be here. My grandpa, um, William James Morrison, and his father, James William Morrison, uh, both worked in a lumber camp up by Guston Township, which is by Lincoln and Harrisville, Black River, up in that area. And then my grandmother, Bessie Ranger, and her mother, Elizabeth Ranger, uh, both worked as cooks at the same uh, lumbering camp. And uh, so they met and presumably fell in love, and the, the rest is history. In reading this book to you, it was published in 1975, I believe the copyright has expired, um, and, I, and it certainly has been out of print for quite a long time. However, if I am, have stepped on anybody's toes with copyrights on this, um, please, please uh, comment, write, let me know. Um, but it's a, it's a fascinating account that most anybody interested in Michigan history ought to enjoy. So without further commentary from me, I hope you'll enjoy my reading of Lumber Camp Life in Michigan, and this is the preface. This little book has been prepared for the purpose of recording a first-hand eyewitness account uh, of activities and environment of the early days of Michigan lumber camps. It is not a history of Michigan lumbering, but only a glimpse of some aspects of that history. The period covered herein started 94 years ago and ended 17 years later. The social, economic, and industrial changes since this brief period, which ended only um, 67 years ago, have been so drastic and far-reaching as to make this record seem of the far distant past. I am wondering what the ways of life of 1974 will look like to those living in the year 2011, only 67 years away. The photographs herein were from a collection my father had saved. Many photographs from this collection were lost. He hired photographers such as D.E. E. Whipple of Fife Lake and a man named Beebe to come to his camp and to photograph the activities there. Part 1 Autobiography of Jacob Dye from 1880 to 1893 <clears throat> This was written by Jacob Dye at the age of 84. I was born in 1875 in Sheridan Township, Macosta County, Michigan. I will always remember that big hill up which we carried water that sometimes Dad, Morris G. Dye, would draw a barrel full up with the oxen which saved lots of steps for my brothers and me. I remember in 1880 and 1881, during the open winter that was so bad for the lumbermen, there was no snow to haul logs to the river, so most every lumberman went broke. Large pine trees on my father's homestead were also fresh in, are also fresh in my memory for the following reason. Father came from Ohio and did not know how long um, pine stumps would, uh, would last and that they would not rot away like hardwood. He girdled the pines so that they would die and rot away so he could clear and farm the land, which was the main idea in his mind at the time. And that did not... Uh, that they did not rot and gave him a lot of work in clearing that land. Dur during the winter of 1881 and 1882, there was a schoolhouse built on the southwest corner of Father's homestead. It was built of hemlock logs about 20 feet wide with a flat roof made of logs split in half and then troughed out like eaves. These troughs, or troughed out logs, were placed so the troughs were up on the bottom layer um, with the overlapping troughs down on the top layer, making a roof which did not let water in or keep wind out. My father was the, uh, was the teacher at that uh, first year at that schoolhouse, which was four months long. Three brothers and a sister from one family, um, from one, one other family, myself and three of my brothers were the only students that first year. The second year, a new family came into the area with two more children, and we had two terms of three months each. 
We were getting too big for the old schoolhouse, and the school board voted to build a nice frame school building one half mile south of the old school, with about one acre of land for the school lot. It was right in the woods with virgin timber on all four sides. We spent a lot of happy days here. I drove past this spot in 1927 and stopped, looking back and thinking what, what a change had taken place in 40 years. About 1885, our house, built of hewed logs, burned down, and it's a sight I will always remember. It was a total loss, and by this time there were nine children in our family. Father and mother were so grieved, they gave up the farm and moved to Macosta, then a small lumbering town where I saw for the first time a railroad train. I was now about 14 years old with three brothers older than myself. We all worked and got a home started. We made friends fast and really lived it up for a few years. But then came the panic of 1893 with hard times for nearly everybody. The family began to get separated. One brother was in Wisconsin, another in North Dakota. When I was 15 years old, my oldest brother came home and wanted me to go with him to saw logs for the George Collins Lumber Company um, at a camp 10 miles north of Horsehead Lake. Father and mother agreed to this, and I walked the 15 miles to the camp on Sunday afternoon and became a real lumberjack and the youngest man on the company time books. My brother and I had the job of sawing logs for what was called a bucking crew. Each crew had six men and two horses. Their job was to cut, skin, and deck logs for sleigh hauling. A timber fitter planned the falling of the trees so that um, they could be sawed into logs as easily as possible. He determined the proper length to cut the logs so that when they were cut into lumber, they would produce the most profit. He also planned the falling of the trees so brush and waste parts would be out of the way when it came to getting the logs. Two swampers <clears throat> cut and piled brush out of the way so the logs could be dragged on the ground by a team of horses to the skidways for decking. Logs were often decked 15 to 20 feet high in large piles. Our crews were not known by a man's name, but instead were identified by the names of horses and teamsters of each crew. Our crew was Fred and Prince Collins. The logs were scaled each day, which gave the information on how much timber they contained. The total for each crew for the day was posted each evening on a bucking board. Every man was interested in making as good a showing as possible. The amount of logs sawed, skidded, and decked by each team was generally about the same. This camp had 12 teams skidding, or, or 12 crews of six men, and one uh, team of horses doing, um, doing the foregoing work. At the end of each week, the crew having the biggest scale of logs received a premium of 50 cents apiece, in trade at the camp store for clothing, mittens, tobacco, and such. The buildings in the camps were, where we stayed were about 80 feet long, and then about 8 feet high at the wall, and about 24 feet wide with a peaked roof. This pitched roof made a ceiling high, which helped the ventilation of this large room, where from 100 to 130 men slept in bunks. These bunks were like a box, about 4 feet wide, six feet long and about eight inches deep filled with straw. Each man had two heavy blankets and if you could get a grain sack to fill with straw you had a pillow. If you couldn't get a grain sack you just did the best you could without one. But the food was good and, and lots of it. The dining room had three tables each about 40 feet long with benches on both sides. Every man had his own place at the table, and not a word was spoken at the meal, except to have something passed you that you could not reach, which was seldom. A man could be discharged quicker for any dis disorder in the dining room than for almost anything else. At 9 p.m. sharp, the lights were put out by the chore boy, who had full charge. Everything had to be quiet till 5 o'clock a.m. when the cook blew the horn for us to get ready for breakfast. At 5.30 a.m., he blew the horn again to come and get it. About the middle of January, I got tired of the camp and went home. I got a due bill for the balance due me and got some groceries for my folks at home. I was proud of what I had earned, and it helped the family a lot. By spring, I was anxious to go someplace again and so started searching for work. I finally got a job sorting lumber, and it was hard work. While the foreman was very good to me, 
It was too hard for me, and I had to give it up. Although it paid $1.35 per day for only 11 hours work, with 57 cents a day taken off um, for board, which was good pay at that time. I rested up at home for a while and had lots of fun with my brothers and sisters for a few weeks. But I then heard that the railroad from Acosta to Winchester and on to Barrington was started. I got a job from a good old Irishman named John Doyle as a handy boy on the construction and worked at this job for about three months. I found I could get better pay than the railroad could give me out, out in the timber where the ties were being made for the railroads. So I quit my friend Mr. Doyle and I went to work scoring ties for Dad Evans, a grand old man who would only hire young fellows. He paid $1.50 a day and board with pay every week. I now had lots of money and I had lots of fun. I chewed tobacco, I smoked peerless, and took a drink now and then. I felt like I was a grown up man. By the end of, of the summer, the railroad had gotten to Winchester and stopped for the winter. I went back home and there was not much work to be had. A man around Macosta was getting woodsmen together for work in the Upper Peninsula. Um, so I took a job with him. We shipped in November to Hubble Junction on the Sioux Line, which is where Rexton is now. The camp was four miles from Hubble Junction. All we could do here was work, but we were happy. We had stag dances and played cards and got along well. In April of 1893, I left to get out of the snow and headed for home. At this point, Jacob Dye was 18 years of age, and also at this point the narrative ends, but um, there was a continued commentary which says, Jacob Dye continued in the lumbering business, and being an aggressive driving man, established himself as an owner. He was able to do any job in lumbering, including scaling logs, timber cruising, and selling the product. On July 2nd, 1898, he married Gracie Sullivan, and on September 12th, 1889, or 1899, a son Rex Dye was born. No record exists for the years intervening between 1893 and 1898, but by the time his first son was born, he was 24 years old, and he had his own camp. He operated the Boyne Falls, Sharon Sigma area, largely in cedar, which included railroad tides, hand-hewed, and later sawed by mill, fence posts, shingles, and floats for commercial, commercial fishing nets. He did some lumbering in hardwood and pine, but cedar was the primary wood. He later worked as a tie inspector and buyer for the Pier Marquette Railroad. Part 2, 1904 to 1909, Recollections of Rex Dye, son of Jacob Dye. I was born in one of the first of my father's lumber camps near Boyne Falls, Michigan in 1899. Many of my recollections of, lum of the lumbering days are like still pictures taken from a single frame of a, mo of a movie film, with no memory of preceding or subsequent frames or events, and with no remembrances of their sequence. Memory is an interesting phenomenon. Perhaps the introduction of an experience removed from the usual routine of activity, and so possessing unique characteristics, makes a much stronger impression on one's consciousness than ordinary day-to-day -day occurrences, and so accounts for this retention in memory. Such experiences gain high attention value, particularly where they are pleasurable. Among the earliest of <clears throat> such remembered events for me is that of setting astride my father's back um, my father's back, legs, and each side of his neck while he was timber cruising. Timber cruising was a matter of checking out a stand of timberland to determine what it would yield as a logging operation. The method employed three men, one to the right and one to the left of the timber cruiser. They would start um, on one side of the wood of the wooded tract. One man at the west boundary. Some distance farther into the woods would be the uh, cruiser, and about the same distance farther into the woods would be a, the third man of the team. Starting at the boundary, for example, the north limit of the woods, they would walk south, guided by a compass, until they reached the southern boundary. Then the cruiser would move to the east to the man on his left, who would work back along the same path that he um, had first took south, and the man on his right would shift to the east of the timber cruiser. Then the group would go north to the northern boundary. 
In this manner, maintaining about the same distances between each man, they would traverse the entire tract. When the tract was covered, the timber cruiser would know with surprising accuracy what the tract would yield in terms of board feet when the um, logging crews went through it. I have no idea how this estimate was arrived at. I only recall the memory of going through the woods in this manner and my father telling me what they were doing. I do not remember where we came from nor where we went afterwards. But this recollection is vivid. I have, a, I have the compass he used. It is set in two solid hinged pieces of mahogany wood about three and a half inches square which close like a box and deactivate the compass needle. Another scene that occurs to me while um, with my father was seeing an old uh, small locomotive rusted and alone on a short piece of track surrounded by second growth timber. It was a wood burner and had a funnel shaped smokestack. The rail stopped at each end of the engine. No track led away from it. It had apparently been abandoned while the <coughs> rails it had once uh, steamed over had been pulled up and taken away. New growth had obliterated the railroad bed it had once traveled. I have often wondered who used this engine and what happened to it since. <clears throat> I do not remember where it was nor anything of the day before or the day after. I was probably about five years old at the time. <clears throat> Another early recollection is being on a large raft which had a tent on it and a small iron stove. It was a float on the river behind a lot of logs which were probably being floated to some mill pond further downstream. In connection with this, I can remember logs shooting down from the river bank into the river, making a big splash as they hit the water. But here again, no preceding or subsequent events come to mind. Again, I remember riding in the caboose of a train. I was sitting in the little cupola at the top of the caboose, and my straw hat blew out of the window. The conductor pulled a cord of some kind and stopped the train, and after they told the engineer what had happened, the train backed up and they got my hat. Where we came from or where we were going, I do not remember, but this incident is still vivid in my memory. I can also remember being in a rowboat on a mill pond with a, a lot of logs around us. Why we were there, I do not know, but I suppose it was for some kind of checkup on, on the logs which had been floated down the river to the mill. The fact that being in a boat was a new and unusual experience for me perhaps accounts for the fact that this experience is remembered. My first memories of my father's lumber camps include the way they were built, the daily routine involved, the discipline my father maintained, and the activities of lumberjacks in the camps, in the woods, and in town on payday. I recall living in a log building at, um, at one time, but the, but the camp buildings I remember most clearly were of sawed lumber covered with tar paper. The camp included um, a, a men's shanty, a cook shanty, and a blacksmith shop, as well as stables for the houses. Later camps had um, a sawmill for, for cutting railroad ties, which replaced the hewed ties, additional equipment for cutting lumber, making shingles and later floats for commercial fishing nets were added. These machines were powered with wood-burning steam engines and all this equipment was hauled through the timber to the camp location with teams of horses. A lot of clearing and road building was necessary to get this machinery through the woods to the site where it was to be in operation. The cook shanty had a kitchen and dining room which was furnished with long tables and benches made on the spot. The men's shanty had rows of bunks along the walls for sleeping. These bunks were equipped with mattresses and springs and were double-decked like those in a, in a sleeping car. My father believed he could get better men and more work done if he offered good beds and good food. These were what we might call today fringe benefits that would be found in a few lumber camps at the time, but not met that many. Perhaps his a previous experience with camp food and straw mattresses led him to take this view. The blacksmith shop had a forge which was operated with a hand bellows and anvil, hammers and tongs of various kinds and a vice, files and other tools for repairing equipment, sharpening saws and making various things. The horse barns had stalls for horses and storage areas for hay and grain as well as racks for harnesses, log chains and other equipment. 
outhouses were rough shacks with a long pole from which the bark had been removed with a draw knife for a seat, strategically placed parallel to the pit, and uh, not the last word to be sure in comfort, but they were practical. These various buildings were usually covered with tar paper to keep out the rain and melted snow and were heated by wood-burning stoves made of sheet iron. <coughs> The daily routine at the camps was basically rise at dawn and work till night. After breakfast, the timber crews left for the locations they were working in, um, taking a substantial supply of food with them for, new, for the noon meal. Upon returning to camp at the end of the day, they cleaned up and had a hearty supper, following which they busied themselves with such chores as sharpening axes, filing saws, um, sawing up firewood, greasing their boots, and similar type jobs. Axes were sharpened on a hand-turned grindstone which had a can of water rigged over the top of the circular stone from which water ran in a very small stream to the face of the stone. The axe was held to this face and ground to the highest sharpness that the stone could produce, after which the lumberjack went to work on the cutting edge um, of the axe with a whetstone producing a razor-sharp edge. Grindstones were made at Grindstone City, a community at the tip of the thumb between Huron City and Point, Ar I'm going to mess this up, Albarks, Michigan. Grindstones were shipped by water to many industrial areas. Grindstone City had quarries where huge deposits of sandstone, suitable for this use, made this industry possible. The harbor here is still bordered with hundreds of rejected grindstones used as breakwaters. Some of these stones are several feet in diameter. I remember turning grindstones for the lumberjacks, and when they wanted to horseplay, they would bear down heavy with the axe on the stone, which made it hard to turn. Then they would ease up and laugh about it. Filling saw, filing saws was a more technical operation, which was done by only a few of the men, including my father. The cross-cut saws had two cutting teeth beveled to cut each side of the saw path. These two cutting teeth were followed by a raker which carried the wood um, freed by the cutting teeth out, <coughs> out of the log. The teeth on the uh, saw were filed sharp with the uh, width of the cut by cutting teeth was set according to the kind of timber on which the saw was used. Saw filing to get the best action from the saw was an art in itself. Boots were waterproof by rubbing them with a hot mixture of tallow, beeswax, and a, a little lamp black, which they called lickdob. This mixture was prepared in a large can and heated on one of the stoves in the men's shanty. It was applied to the boots with a stick, which had cloth wrapped around one um, end to carry the waterproofing mixture while it was hot. The boots they wore were of leather with a thick leather sole. The soles were studded with pointed um, caulks, which made it possible for the lumbermen to work on a fallen tree, trimming, scoring, and hewing it for railroad ties without losing its footing or slipping. When handling a double-bitted axe or a broad axe standing on the tree you were working on, a slip of the foot could be disastrous. I recall one inst instance where this happened with the broad axe blade going through a man's boot, costing him several toes. Clothing worn by the lumberjacks during the winter lumbering operations consisted of long johns, heavy wool pants, which were usually sta stagged, um, button-up legs cut off to clear the boots, um, wool shirts, mackinaw-type coats, wool socks, caulked boots and stocking caps or visored wool caps with ear flaps. Work in the woods necessitated clearing roadways and sometimes building roads up with brush trimmed from fallen timber. Sometimes corduroy roads were built using small logs laid crosswise on the road to provide support for the loads to be hauled. Logs were loaded um, on bobsleighs by means of a boom carrying a pulley arrangement with horses supplying the power. One man stood on the sleigh with a cant hook and guided the logs into position. The logs loaded on the sleigh were held in position by heavy log chains and then hauled to the mill for sawing into railroad ties, shingles, and any needed lumber. Flat cars at the rail loading points were also loaded in the same manner as the sleighs were.
Logs were scaled with a rule which made it possible to hold the scale in position across the diameter of the butt of the log so the number of board feet could be read. Roads were kept clear with horse-drawn snow plows and iced over by hauling a water tank with a spray arrangement over the road. This icing served to firm the road and reduce friction for the loads of logs being hauled. Skidways to haul logs from the woods to the loading point were also sometimes iced in this manner. Logs were skidded to these points by horses without sleighs. They were simply dragged over the snow. My father maintained a strict discipline in his camps. He allowed no drinking or card playing and enforced his rules physically when necessary. I recall one incident very clearly which illustrates the type of enforcement that he used. He was making the rounds of the camp and I was tagging along behind him. He had hired two new men and um, that very day and he might have been checking up on them. He opened the door of the men's shanty and walked in. A card game was in progress, apparently started by these two new men. He walked over to the table, grabbed one of them by the front of his shirt, and literally threw him across the room. This one landed in one of the bunks and stayed there. The other fellow, who looked bigger than my father, had gotten up from the table and was ready to start fighting. But he started much too late. As my father moved in fast, hit him, and he went to sleep on the floor. My father did not fire these men, and they were working the next day, but there were no more card games started by them. This all seems rather brutal, but in those days in that area, you couldn't call a policeman, and law and order was a matter of a man's will and ability to enforce it. Card games were always for money, and it could, and could be depended upon to cause serious trouble, as was the case with drinking. My father was far from a teetotaler and did not care what these lumberjacks did in town on paydays. If they were drunk, they were piled on a sleigh and hauled back to camp after their spree in town, but in the camp, drinking was simply not allowed. Among the tools the lumberjack used were a double-bitted axe with a straight handle, which was an axe with two cutting edges, one used mostly for trimming branches from fallen trees, and one used for scoring ties, of which more will be told later. The crosscut saw, which came in two basic forms, the one-man saw with a handle similar to a handsaw, and a two-man saw, which had an upright round handle at each end, which a man could grasp with both hands in order to pull the saw back and forth to himself after his partner had pulled it away from him. For hewing ties, a broad axe was used. This axe had a heavy blade, a foot for more... Uh, a, a blade a foot or more long with a beveled edge like a carpenter's chisel. The handle was curved and it seemed to me to have been one of the most ungainly and awkward tools I've ever seen. In the hands of a real tie maker, however, the broad axe was be a beautiful tool. He could produce a finished tie with clean, graceful strokes, strokes of this tool with an even thickness and a smooth, true surface. Ties were stamped with a hammer-like tool that left an identifying initial when the butt end of the tie was struck with it. In handling logs, rolling them into position for cutting, loading on sleighs, and stacking, a cant hook was used. This was a heavy hook type of tool with the hook hinged to a ring through which a rugged straight handle <coughs> permitted um, terminating in a, in a steel ring with projections at each end which lined up with the point of the swinging hook as the hook of the tool was free to move to fit various diameters of logs and bite into the log surface the cant hook gave a great leverage for the operation of rolling um, a log or controlling um, the, its movements. A PV used mostly for handling logs on the river was about the same as a cant hook, but the handle extended further below uh, the hook and carried a heavy uh, spike-like terminal, which would not slip when jammed into a log um, to, be, to move it. Tape lines were used for measuring. Those I remember were in a heavy leather case with a real type action to wind the tape back after using it. Draw knives were used for peeling smaller cedar logs for fence posts. While my father lumbered in hardwood as well as cedar, the cedar camps stand out much stronger in my memory, particularly the tie camps. 
cedar was probably the most suitable and longest lasting timber for railroad ties, and they were much in demand at that time. The first ties I saw were hand to were made um, by hand hewing. Suitable cedar trees were fallen by the lumberjacks using axes and crosscut saws. These trees were trimmed of all branches and then fixed in position for hewing, supported by logs with an axe driven in <coughs> on each side of the log to be hewed to ensure the stability of the position. The hewing process consisted of two operations. First, scoring with a double-bitted axe by making slanted cuts into the log on each side. Second, hewing these two sides to a relatively sm smooth surface using the broad axe um, with its chiseled shape cutting edge um, in long sweeping strokes in the opposite direction from which the scoring cuts were made. The hewed logs were then cut by a cross-cut saw to the required lengths for the railroad ties, and the finished ties were piled for hauling and delivery to the rail facility. After my father acquired his sawmill, the hand -hewn, uh, hewing of railroad ties stopped. Cedar logs were hauled to the mill and there sawed to the required thickness and length. I believe, however, the hewed ties were considered superior to those mill, um, those mill sawed, having a smoother surface which contributed to longer life. Later, I believe, various hardwoods were used with finished um, with finished ties <clears throat> being treated with creosote under pressure, perhaps because the supply of cedar had become exhausted. Two other operations added to the sawmill fascinated me, the first being the shingle mill, and the second make it, the making of floats for use by Great Lakes commercial fishermen on their nets. The shingle mill, as I remember, it consisted of four fundamental operations. First, cutting the logs into sections of proper length, for the shingles, second, sawing to get the wedge shape of the shingle, third, not sawing to get straight and not free edges, and fourth, to sort, band, and bale. After the logs were cut into sections of the desired length, they were moved to, a, uh, to, a, to the shingle saw. This was a large circular saw lying flat in a horizontal position, equipped with a tilting movable table that made it possible to cut each successive slice from the section sped into it at, a, at the proper angle for use as a shingle. These rough shingles were thrown into a bin uh, for the knot sawyers to cut and trim to finish sizes. The knot saw was a small high-speed circular saw past which the sliding table was moved by hand carrying the rough cut shingle stock. The knot sawyer placed a piece of, of uh, the rough cut stock on this table and trimmed it on both sides to what in his judgment was the best width. He then tossed his finished shingle over to the bin behind him for the sorting and baling operation. These high-speed knot saws <coughs> and the sliding table arrangement were dangerous and many knot sawyers were lacking one or more fingers. The, the baling operations consisted of sorting the shingles, no two of which were likely to be of the same width in successive layers, to make up a bundle, then compressing them in a press and fastening them with metal straps to make up the, a bundle. As these bundles had to be fairly uniform in size, and the edges or sides neat and even, this operation must have required a certain talent, especially when working at a high speed, as those fellows did. My father, after checking, the, uh, checking with the uh, commercial fishermen at Traverse City, decided to make floats for use on the nets used by this industry on the Great Lakes. These floats were um, perhaps eight or nine inches long, three inches in diameter, and were rounded on both ends. They had a hole running through the center so that they could be threaded on the nets at required intervals. I went to Traverse City once with my father and had a ride on one of the fishing boats, the owner of which used the floats made at the mill um, of the lumber camp. Hemlock logs were peeled for the bark to be used in tanning of leather. I remember seeing tan bark loaded on big schooners at Boyne City. The loaders were called dock wallopers. They wore heavy leather aprons and carried the bundles of bark over a gangplank and onto the ship. 
The crew of the Lumberjacks got paid once a month, and on payday they went into town on a bobsled covered with straw and with a few blankets spread over the straw. Sharon, Michigan is the town I remember in uh, this connection. Sharon had a grocery store run by a man named Tid. He all, was also an artist, and I recall the time he showed me a big artist palette which, which he had. Sharon also had, as I recall, two or three saloons, a schoolhouse where I, and, where I and my brother went to school, a railroad station consisting of a boxcar supported by round cedar blocks, and a few shanties of rough lumber covered with tar paper against the weather. <clears throat> there were no churches in Sharon, as I remember it anyways. It was a small, end-of-the-line community serving the lumbering operations. In the summertime, it was a shipping point for huckleberries commercially picked by transients in the huckleberry plains in this area, particularly near Naples, Michigan, um, a small settlement that was east of Sharon, uh, which does not appear on any present state maps. Naples, during the huckleberry season, was a town consisting of tents occupied by the berry pickers. The population was large enough to support several berry, um, berry buyers, and these people lived here only during the huckleberry season. They were really camping out, doing their cooking and washing at their tent homes and visiting in the evenings. When the lumberjacks arrived in town on paydays, their first stop was the grocery store, where they stocked up on plug tobacco, smoking tobacco, new socks, and other clothing that they might need. They also brought delicacies they, or bought delicacies they did not get in camp, such as canned peaches or other fruit, which they took out to the sleigh, opened with knives, and ate outdoors with great relish. Then they headed for the saloons to drink, play cards, and have stag dances as there were no women available. These stag dances were uh, boisterous affairs as the men wore heavy caulked boots, stomping and kicking and jigging to the music and really letting off steam after a month in the woods. As I remember it, the music was supplied by someone with an accordion and another man with a banjo. I do not recall what tunes um, were to which they danced except that they were fast and noisy. I vaguely remember the words Mary Ann McGee and Down at Casey's Dump as fragments from some of these songs. The dances <clears throat> were often broken up with fights, some of which were pretty rough. I recall seeing one lumberjack stop, stomp his caulked boots across the face of another whom had um, been knocked down onto the floor. The face of the, of the man who was stomped resembled um, fresh and bloody hamburger. As evening came to an end, the heads of the various camps got their crews together, loaded them on bobsleds, and headed back to their respective camps. The men who were too drunk to move under their own power were laid out on the blankets on the sleighs and would be ready to go back to work after they had sobered up. They would, however, if uh, they worked for my father, stay sober till the next payday. The only exception I can remember to this rule of my father's was a cook he had who um, would get well oiled between paydays on lemon extract. He must have been a very good cook as my father did not fire him but, inst but instead tried to keep him off the stuff. One day, however, the cook disappeared and my father later found him in the state hospital for the insane at Traverse City. Perhaps the lemon extract um, addiction finally caused such deterioration of the brain cells as to destroy him. In the summer, when working the cedar swamps was impossible, my father sometimes set up a tent store at Naples during the huckleberry season. He would supply quart boxes and berry crates for the pickers and buy berries from them for shipment to city markets. He also had a stock of supplies for sale to the pickers such as coffee, groceries, and tobacco. Lumberjacks rarely smoked cigarettes, although a few would roll their own using Bull Durham or Prince Albert tobacco. Smoking was mostly pipe smoking with the uh, corn cob or briar pipe most in use. Tobacco used was mostly five brothers, Peerless, Giant, and Prince Albert, as I recall it, and the first three of these brands were strong enough to ruin a pipe for most, um, uh, for most smokers today. Most lumberjacks chewed tobacco such as spearhead plug, light and dark burly, which came in a large round <clears throat> tin holding, holding a pound. Mail pouch and some scrap mixtures were sweet and juicy. Most of them 
uh, took pride in being able to do a day's work in their skill with the axe, saw, or other activity of the camps. They were paid about a dollar a day and board, as I recall it, uh, the amount a bricklayer today would earn in about six minutes. If they wanted to go anywhere, they walked except on paydays when they rode into, into the town. An automobile was something you heard about but rarely saw at those times. The first one I saw was in Traverse City much later. It was a steam-powered vehicle and was having trouble keeping up enough steam to keep it in motion. I remember several boys and myself following it on foot around town. In summer, the cedar swamps were wet and filled with mosquitoes. They used to say that the mosquitoes were so big they could, have, they could eat a man and then pick their teeth with a, with a peavey. I can recall my brother and I exploring in, the, in these swamps, going from log to log and water a foot or more deep beneath the logs and fallen timbers. Cedar lumbering was a winter activity insofar as woods working was concerned. Logs stockpiled at the mill, however, could be processed into ties, shingles, and net floats during the summer months. My brother and I went to school at Sharon for several winters, walking about three miles from the camps. Once, when we were going home from school, a big bobcat, or lynx, started following us. I told my brother to get well ahead of me, and I <clears throat> had a solid club in my hand ready to use if necessary. The cat continued to follow us, but as we neared the camp, it decided to leave and disappeared. We told our folks about it when we got home, and my father and one of the men uh, backtrailed us. They found um, big cat tracks, but no cat. In the summer, we went swimming in Cannon Creek and Devil's Creek and went trout fishing with homemade tackle. We could always get enough brook trout for a good meal using grasshoppers or angleworms for bait. Fishing was largely a matter of getting to the stream as the dense brush and undergrowth made it rough going. The water was very clear and very cold, ideal for brook trout. During the winter, we spent a great deal of time outdoors, even camping um, out with no tent. We would, fall a, um, we would fall a small tree, trim it, and place it between two branches of a larger tree. We would then trim some smaller poles and arrange them slanting from this ridge pole back to the ground, covering um, them with brush from the cedars to make a good shelter. We would then roll a, up um, a log up in front of the... Uh, of the open side and <clears throat> excuse me of this shelter and use it as a backup for a a fire which kept us warm and upon which we could fry bacon and speckled trout to make a meal i had one experience with yellow jackets i remember well a yellow jacket is a particularly vicious type of bee that nests in the ground and will attack in swarms I sat down in what appeared to be a small mound. It was a yellow jacket colony. They went after me, stung me, and chased me almost home. When I told my father what had happened, he got a long pole, wrapped one end of it with rags, and tied them on. Then he soaked the rags with kerosene and went back to the yellow jacket nest, lit the rags, and shoved the burning torch into it. That ended the, jack the yellow jacket problem. While deer, bear, fox, and other wildlife were quite plentiful, there was never much hunting or trapping around the camps. Once in a while, someone would get a deer with his 30-30 Winchester or Marlin, uh, but the meat was not particularly appetizing to the lumberjacks who would rather, be, would rather have had their baked beans and salt pork. My father seemed never to have any fear of anything but spiders and snakes. I recall in one camp um, we were in which... Um, was in an area infested with snakes. He solved the problem by buying a lot of, of hogs and turning them loose in the area. He later had the hogs slaughtered, which provided a lot of fresh pork roasts and chops, as well as plenty of salt pork for the crews. He also had a lot of this meat fried and packed in the uh, lard rendered from the pork. It kept well and tasted like fresh um, fried pork when reheated for the table. One experience that I remember vividly was a uh, visit my father and I made to an old man who lived alone in a one-room log cabin. This man seemed very old to me at the time. He stood at the door with a rifle in his hand, but when he saw who it was, he asked us to come in. 
The thing that made a great impression on me was the fact that he had built shelving which covered one whole wall of this room, and these shelves were cubby holes filled with, El with Edison cylinder records. He had an Edison phonograph um, with a big flower-shaped horn and played a lot of those records for us. I had never seen a phonograph before, and to hear the music coming out of that horn was almost unbelievable at the time. Here again, I do not know where we came from or where we went afterwards, but this experience is still with me. It probably happened about 1905 when I was six years old. Now, in 1973, these memories and experiences occurring well over half a century ago seem remote and almost unreal. If one were to have said then that you would be able to turn a knob on a box smaller than an orange crate and see a live picture of uh, such an event as the Watergate investigation or that men would travel to the moon, you would have been considered ready for the booby hatch. And perhaps half a century from now, our present way of life and technology will seem equally as primitive to our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And I wonder if future generations will be as close to the realities of life and living as we were in those days a half a century ago.